So, everybody doing good tonight? Every, everybody get some food tonight? How was the food tonight? Was it good? Thank you again to the food ministry. Thank you very much. So, next week, if you come back at 4.30, we are going to be serving a beef or turkey sloppy joes with some chips and salad. So, bring your bibs with you for the sloppy joes. Okay, so... Upcoming, so did everybody get a bulletin when they came in? Everybody got one of the bulletins? So let's see what we have going on inside here. Of course, our weekly event is our creation fellowship class. Every Thursday night at 6.30, we meet over at the Creation and Earth History Museum. And we study things on creation, on science, and on history. And we see how it supports the biblical account of creation. So if you're able to, we'd love to see you come out there on a Thursday night check out what we do out there and and it'll be a great time it's just a great bunch of people to get together and we learn so much about god's creation and how science supports the biblical account of creation and then also for the young ones if you have young ones you can introduce them there quickly by coming to our kids creation club on the first saturday of every month now the next one will be saturday february 1st and, of course, there's a $5 charge, and it starts at 10 o'clock in the morning, a great way to introduce the young ones to God's creation, let them understand how science works, how history works, and how it supports the biblical account of creation. So, now, on the back of your brochure, did anyone notice that we have new missionaries of the month? John and Nancy Hook, they are missionaries with Mission Aviation Fellowship. And if you get a chance to read their story about their mission trip that they spent, well, they spent a lot of time in Indonesia. And just this past year, they actually had the New Testament written and published in the Moscona language, the Moscona tribe people out there. And they said when the copies were delivered to the village that the tribe celebrated for several days that they were so excited to have a copy of the Word of God. And I thought about it. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, it's getting close, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation will hear the gospel. And here's another tribe that has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's an, um, just an amazing. So if you get a chance uh, to read this about the hooks as the missionary of the month. So let us continue the worship the Lord in our giving. Here at Friendship with God, we do not pass the plate around. But back there on our table, we do have our tithe and offering box. And you can slip your tithe and offering back there. We have also envelopes where you can put it in. And also we have prayer cards. If you would like to write down some prayers, if it's confidential, you can just stick it in the box. And we'll make sure that we pray as a staff. Or if it's not, then, then you can let us know and we can pray for you. And again, after the service, again, anybody that wants prayer, who needs some prayer, please come on up front to the, um, by the stage here. And we'll make sure that we pray with you guys, okay? So, let's pray and let's get our hearts prepared for the service. And you know what? I just realized it. And I'm up here thinking I'm doing the, uh, the uh, announcements again. Well, now the announcements are done. So now we can start with the worship. So, how about we turn to in our hymns to hymn number 117. I did that again. That's the second time I did that. But that's okay. We're going to worship the Lord here. Let's turn to hymn number 117 in our hymnals, and we're going to sing, Fearest Lord Jesus.
and great job, you guys. Okay, so the next one in your hymnals is hymnal number 623, and it is the Solid Rock. And Jesus' blood and righteousness. Next one is number 634 in your hymnals, and this is Jesus Never Fails. Since I already did the announcements, we're going to do the fourth hymn, and we'll just get that one done. How about we do that one? So in our hymnals, we're going to turn to number 329, and this song is Complete in Thee.
great job out there tonight. You guys did a great job as the choir. So let us pray and let's get prepared for the service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are complete in thee. Lord, you are everything that we need. We give you the thanks and the praise for that. And now, Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts for the message tonight, that through this message that we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened, and we would be prepared for the week ahead, that you would encourage us through the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we pray that you would speak through Sorab, that your spirit would teach us exactly what you want to teach us tonight. And so we want to give you all the praise and all the glory in everything that we do and everything that's said tonight. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now here is our Bible teacher, So Rob Ramtine. Thank you. Well, good evening. I'm glad to be with you again and worshiping God together. Praise the Lord. Uh, if you could please turn your Bibles to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 15. We are look, going to, looking tonight at verses 8 through 10, the second of the three parables that our Lord taught and are written for us, recorded for us in this chapter. I'm going to read verses 8 through 10, after, and after prayer, we will look into it and study the, the text. Luke 15, 10, Luke 15, verse 8, where Jesus speaking, saying, Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that we can be together with brothers and sisters here uh, tonight and worshiping you, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, in the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We commit our time to your hand. May you be our teacher. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher and open the word to us so that we can understand it. May it be by your grace that we will not be just hearer, but the doer of the word. And the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in our life. For in his name we pray all these things. Amen. In our study of this chapter when you come to Luke chapter 15, uh, the topic that you will see permeate all through the chapter, the topic that we want to consider is the joy of heaven. This chapter is all about heaven's joy, uh, or if you will, God's joy. The joy because of recovering a lost. Scripture says that when Christians arrive in heaven, they enter into the joy of their Lord. The, and this is the uh, thing that this is a theme that you see all over this whole chapter. The pervasive character of heaven is summed up in the word joy. And it is really a place of joy. God's joy, heaven joy. Everything in heaven produces complete satisfaction fulfillment, completion, and therefore produces perfect joy. That's why we read in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy, and joy. The perfection of heaven and the eternal presence of God provides, in fact, the Bible says, a joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's a joy that cannot be described or defined. Now, we experience a measure of that joy here and now, the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the joy of knowing that our future in heaven is secure, the joy of anticipating seeing Christ face to face, the joy of looking forward for the second coming of our Lord, 
the joy of anticipating re reunion with believers who have gone before us, the joy that comes to our heart from understanding the scripture, understanding and gaining the knowledge of truth. As First John says, these, these things written that you might have joy and your joy may be full, may be complete. So already in some measure, we live with joy. We can experience a measure of joy even in this uh, fallen world. In fact, wherever our joy is not what it should be, we are commanded to rejoice always, as Philippians chapter 4 tells us. Rejoice always, and again I say to you, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, not in the circumstances, not in your situation, but rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice the fact that your life is in His hand. He is sovereign, He is in control, and He's coming soon. But one of the component and one of the elements of joy of heaven is that for the salvation of sinners. And that is what all these three parables are talking about. The whole chapter 15 is about the joy of heaven when a sinner repents and comes back to the Lord, put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are about joy in heaven, or better to say, God's joy, the joy of God for the salvation of sinners. In fact, Jesus said that uh, he came and went to the cross and endured the suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before him. The joy of God is what this whole chapter 15 is about. The joy that comes to God's heart when a sinner comes to the saving knowledge of Christ. And also, he, and so Christ, because of that, because the whole mission of Christ on earth was to bring glory and joy to God the Father and provide the salvation for us sinner, that's why Christ associated with sinners. He associated with those who knew they were sinful, and also he associated even with the self-righteous people, the people who didn't know they are sinners. And unfortunately, unfortunately, they never took advantage of this immense, great opportunity to be in the presence of the only Savior, but they missed it all. They did not receive his salvation because they were so self-righteous, so proud of themselves. But Jesus spent his time with those who were drawn to him, those who knew they were sinful, those who knew they are bankrupt, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who were meek and mourning and hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And this put him in conflict with self-righteous people, specifically with the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes were the self-righteous, self-appointed, supposedly spiritual leaders of Israel. But one thing that characterized them, in spite of all their differences, was an illusion or an image of purity, which they really didn't have it. And it caused them to be unwilling to touch or get near anybody who was in their crooked view, in their crooked understanding, uh, anybody who they consider unclean. They didn't know the heart of God. They didn't know the heart of God was to rescue sinner, to come all the way down and get close enough to them to embrace them and pick them up in their hopelessness and bring them into his own presence. And that fills God's heart with joy. And you know, whenever you and I are engaged in a ministry of evangelism, whenever you share the gospel, you are bringing joy to God's heart. Doesn't matter whether the person accepts the message of the gospel that you're offering, the fact that you are doing it, the fact that you desire to do that, it brings joy to the hearts of the Father. The Pharisees and the scribes separated themselves from everybody. Uh, everybody that they thought they would in any way pollute them or crop them or stain them or defy them or intrude on their so-called purity or so-called holiness. But Jesus, 
contrary to them, regularly associated with the very people that they shunned. Jesus as God knew the joy of God was in the recovery of the lost, and so he came seeking to save sinners for his own joy and for the joy of his Father and for the salvation of those sinners. Uh, for his own joy, for the joy of the Father, for the joy of the Spirit, and also for the eternal life for those people who come to him. Our Lord associated with sinners, but he did not sin. He was without sin. He was sinless, but he associated with them. He received sinners with love, with grace, when they came toward him, when they came meek and mourning and humble and seeking salvation for their tormented hearts, and he never turned anybody away. He accepted them. He embraced them. He opened the door of his eternal kingdom of salvation and brought them in. Now, as we come to chapter 15, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's been moving that direction for a long time, since chapter 9 of Gospel of Luke, verse 51. He's headed toward Jerusalem. Um, very soon he's, he will arrive there, and there the hurricane of hatred will hit him with its full, for, full, full force. In this text, that hostility again surfaces itself in verses 1 and 2. All the tax collectors, tax gatherers, and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and both the Pharisees and the scribes began to murmur, to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. What kind of a person he is. He claims to be from God. He claims to be teacher of the world. He claims to be son of God. But look at him. What kind of people he associates with. Their regular criticism was always associated with the fact that Jesus spending time with a despised sinner, with those uh, who collaborated with the Roman government and uh, bought tax franchises and extorted money out of the Jewish people. Therefore, in the eyes of the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were traitors to their people. They were traitors to their own religion. They were even traitors to their own God. They were also, the thing that uh, also made those uh, Sadducees and Pharisees very angry, uh, they were equally very outraged that Jesus ate with this kind of people and with other sinners. Not the, the term sinners here refers to moral lawbreakers, adulterers, prostitutes, scum, the riffraff of the society. And Jesus not only associated with them, but he ate with them. And in the Middle Eastern culture and custom, eating with someone is accepting them, is a sign of friendship. For them, Jesus' association with these kind of people was all they needed to attack him and to convince everybody else he was not from God. He saying, look at him, what kind of people he associates. What kind of people are his friends? Yeah, Jesus is a friend of sinners. You are right on that. And I'm, I personally thank God for that. The language in verse 2 is interesting. It says, this man... Receive sinners, they said. Jesus not just only allowed them to come around him, he embraces them. Then he eats with them. And so I said, this is the most outrageous thing in the Near Eastern, Middle Eastern culture because eating with somebody was a sign of friendship. That's why Jesus said that if anyone hears my voice, open the doors, I will go in and eat with him. You will have friendship with me. Friendship with God, the name of our fellowship. So Jesus eating with sinners was, uh, was a way of having friendship with them in their view, and that made them angry. And Jesus answered their murmuring with three parables, three stories. The first two, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin, are actually prologue uh, to the main story. The main story starts from verse 11, the one that we know as the, pro the parable of the prodigal son. The longest parable that Jesus ever taught and really full of uh, all kind of 
interesting thing, all kind of theological thing about God and his heart for uh, saving the lost and his heart for the lost sinners. But he opens up his response to the murmuring and criticism attacks of these Pharisees and ascribe these self-righteous people with a, little par uh, with a little prologue from verse 4 all the way down to verse 10, in which he tells them two simple stories. Now, you have to keep in mind that the main target of this entire chapter is these Pharisees and the scribes who are complaining and criticizing against him. In fact, the first and second story, in the first and second story, Jesus tells a story or a parable in a form of a question. And he pulls those here, those uh, audiences who were there, he pulls them into his story by asking them a question. Pharisees and scribes have to think like a shepherd and to think like a woman. And therefore, they are implicated in this story without actually being a part of this story, without being actually a character of this story. In all of these three stories, however, Pharisees and scribes are exposed as having no understanding of the heart of God. They claim that they know God and they attack the Lord Jesus Christ, but they themselves, Jesus is showing, you know nothing of the heart of God because you don't know what brings joy to his heart. They are really actually the ones on Satan's side because they have no interest in the joy of God. Now you remember, if you read the first parable, the first story, verses four through seven, about a shepherd, a shepherd who had 100 sheep and lost one of them. And usually what happened in the Middle Eastern culture, uh, these sheep belonged to, to different people. They would hire these shepherds to take care of their sheep. And there was a shepherd who was in charge of 100 sheep and lost one of them. But he was not the owner. Somebody else was the owner. So what would you do, Jesus asked, understanding that cultural setting? He asked the Pharisees and the scribe, what would you do if you were in the place of that shepherd and you had 100 sheep and you lost one of them? You would leave the 99 in the open pasture with other shepherds and you go after the one that is lost. Because if you don't do that, then you have to pay for it. The owner will ask for the damages. So you would do that. And that's what you have to do. Um, you will go, uh, see, Jesus is saying that you will go and try to find that sheep. And when you found it, you will put it on your shoulder. You will bring it back exactly that what we read in the parable and then the shepherd will call his friends called his neighbors and said rejoice with me i found my sheep which was lost and they say yes yes we agree that's the right thing to do that's mm, financially right things to do and that's his duty that's a responsible thing for that shepherd to do they would affirm that was the right thing to do and then in verse 7 the Lord makes the application. You know, it's always like this. He tells a story. He draws his hearing into parable, and then he catches them. <laughs> Here comes the punchline. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over those 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And he's saying, you guys know nothing of the heart of God. See how far you are from heaven? You are the 99 self-righteous, righteous in your own thinking, righteous in a sarcastic way. You think you don't need any repentance. You think you don't need to turn to God. You give heaven no joy. Heaven's joy is found in that one sinner who repents and comes back. How far from heaven you are. How far from heaven they really are. Jesus is telling them. They knew what the shepherd would do. He would go find the lost sheep because he had a duty to do it. He had a responsibility to do it. And because the sheep had value, if he couldn't find the sheep, he had to pay out of his own pocket. 
And they would affirm, yes, yes, we agree. This is the right thing to do. This is dutiful, ethical. Uh, but Jesus is saying, you guys are hypocrites. What hypocrisy? You understand finding a sheep. Uh, you understand finding a coin. You understand the joy and celebration because a sheep or a coin is found, but you have no interest in finding a lost soul which has infinitely more value, immensely more value. And in fact, you know, this is always characteristic of false religions and false leaders. The heart of God reaches out to sinners in love and compassion and grace and mercy to save them. False teachers, false prophets, false religions keep their distance. They use and abuse people for their own profit and gain. Now, continuing to confront those Pharisees and Sadducees, our Lord tells the second story. <laughs> One punch after another. Now, the story about the, this woman who lost a coin. And the setting, again, is a village life. Can I just take you there in your mind? You think of it that you are in a little Middle Eastern village in the land of Israel, a little dirt road, and along this little dirt road is a small little village. There is some little, uh, some little earth brick houses made out of bricks with mud and straw, and the little houses are all along the road, and the little road just uh, down, is going down through the middle of the village. That was the little village. They would know this very well. This picture is very common in that time. It's a picture of a simple people, poor people, who face a serious financial matter in this story. This woman has a big problem. She loses something of great value. They didn't have lots of money. And a little bit of money relatively could go a long way. And this woman in this, uh, in, in this village, this village woman in this story has 10 silver coins. But she loses one. And she finds it. And then she has a party. Now, you might say, boy, village life must be <laughs> very dull. <laughs> um, you know, this seems to make... Uh, it seems to me they like to make a party for no reason at all. And you may conclude, hey, if there is any reason to have a party and a celebration, let's have it. Let's have a party. Life is dull. I think it probably was. But I want to take you into the story, and I want you kind of put yourself in the position of those Pharisees who were hearing this story and then how Jesus draws them in. And again, he implicates them. So let's begin in the beginning. Verse 8. I love here how he starts. Now you remember in verse 4, the first parable, he said, what a man among you if he had 100 sheep. And you know, got to know this. You know how would they respond? Uh, just when he starts the, with the first parable, they would say, ah, oh, shepherd? No, 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 no way. Uh, we can't even think of it that we were a shepherd because a shepherd was unclean. And these guys were all so proud of their supposed purity. Shepherds were defiled because they were dealing with these filthy animals. Pharisees wouldn't have anything to do with a shepherd. They wouldn't be a shepherd. They wouldn't go near a shepherd. And Jesus is asking them, think for a moment that you are a shepherd. What one of you, in fact, if you were a shepherd, Jesus is saying, and you were in this kind of situation, what would you do? And he got, he, Jesus caused them in their mind to think of themselves, to conceive of themselves as a shepherd. And thus they had been defiled. And Jesus loves to attack their foolish pride. And again, let me tell you, not out of meanness, but because he wants to humble them, to be, become humble. 
if there is any hope for you to enter the kingdom of God, you must be humble in order to receive God's grace. And then you come to the second parable. <laughs> if anything, it is worse. Now think of it. He makes them in their mind to think as if they are not a shepherd, but a woman. Now just think of it. <laughs> to, to tell to a religious leader of Israel in the first century that think of, think of yourself as a woman was unheard of. This would be viewed as an absolute outright insult to address Pharisees and scribes and ask them to put themselves in a woman place to evaluate how a woman would think and how he, she would behave. You know, you got to think of it the cultural thing, not, not that there's anything wrong to be a woman or in God's side or in Jesus' side, but you got to put yourself in the position of those Pharisees and Sadducees. Here again. Jesus just sweep away their foolish pride. And again, as I said, he doesn't do that out of meanness, but out of mercy, because if there is any hope for those people to enter to the kingdom of God, they must humble themselves to receive his grace if they are going to be saved. And the Pharisees and the scribe, uh, you know, they just, they were outraged. First, he compares them, forced them to think Think of yourself as a shepherd, and now he's forcing them to think as a woman. You know, Pharisees and scribes in those days got up every day and several times would say, I thank you, O God, that I am not a woman. They wouldn't be a shepherd, and certainly they wouldn't be a woman. So Jesus said to them, what if you were a shepherd? And what if you were a woman? What would you do in this kind of situation? And he pushes them into a mental place to have them to think like a shepherd and to forces them to think like a woman. And said, no, let's think of it in this story. If you were in, in place of this woman, what would you do? When we look at the parable, there are four things, four little points you got to consider. Lost, sought, found, celebrated. Lost, sought, found, and celebrated. Just like the one about the shepherd, we'll see the story. You, there's a story, there's an ethic, but then behind that story and behind the ethical principle in the story, there is theology, there is Christology. Verse 8 What woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, and just stop right there, picture. Your, this, that little village that I took you moments ago, a dusty road somewhere in Judea, Israel, a little village, a little home with four walls, uh, a little low doorway, no windows, maybe there's a slit above eye level to let the smoke out of the cooking, the fire inside to go out, and maybe there'll be some ven ventilation in the house. Uh, floor is made of dirt in some parts of Israel, there are cracks, there's dust, there's derbies, and this woman is in this little house. And she lost one of her ten silver coins. The Greek called them drachma, the Romans called them denarius, and they would be a day wage worth. And in ancient time, women would take these coins and they would have them and they would wrap them in some kind of a rag and tie a knot. I guess that's the origin of the woman's purse. The money would be in there and it would be all knotted up and tied for safekeeping and the woman would put it in a safe place. But there is also another possibility. Maybe, uh, um, and probably this is more likely, uh, maybe these ten silver coins were her dowry. Women were given a dowry by, by, their, by their fathers on occasion. Their husband would even give them a dowry, which would act as a security for crisis, something happened in the future. And some of those women would put around these um, uh, coin like a necklace around their neck. Or you may have seen pictures like with Middle Eastern women having these kind of coins uh, hanging with a string around their uh, forehead. 
they would run a cord through the coins that were pierced and then they would wear them er either around their neck or around their forehead. And they would act as security for their future and in this way they always had their security right before their eyes, right in their presence. And this would be for future, what happened if the husband die, if the husband is ill, if there's a disaster in the family, this is their security. Well, it could have been any of these things, and so Jesus asked the question that is going to demand the right answer. What woman? If you were that woman in that kind of situation and you lost one of these coins, what would you do? He's asking from those religious leaders. And they would know what she, what she has to do. They knew that she has only one choice. Uh, you wouldn't say, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, forget it. No, this is a poor family. Of course it matters. So you go from loss to sought in verse 8. She loses one coin. But she's not going to say, oh, it doesn't matter. No, I have nine others. No, 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 no. That's her future security. She lights the lamps, sweeps the house, searches carefully until she finds it. So the diligent search goes on and on and on. The lamp is lit. She gets out her little twig broom. Maybe she made it herself or borrowed from a neighbor. She starts sweeping the house because even on a hard floor of dirt, there is dust on the top. And it says she searches and searches carefully. She reaches with her little broom to every corner of that house, moves everything, lifts up anything that it might have, that coin might have rolled under it, looks in every crack for her light, and she keeps doing it until we come to the third point. Lost, found, lost, sought, and now found in the er end of verse 8. Until she finds it. She keeps searching and searching until she finds it. Doesn't give up. Verse 9. And when she has found it, she's going to do this until she finds it. Why? Because it's precious to her. It belongs to her. It is lost. It needs to be recovered. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the lost coin the one that I lost. Let's have a party. She calls her lady friends. They were very close in that little village. They all knew each other. Everybody's suffering uh, would be everybody else's suffering and everybody's joy would be everybody else's joy. So she calls her lady friends together and they have this wonderful little party and celebration because she has found what she lost. And the point to Pharisees is you understand this, right? You agree. The picture is clear. Of course they would buy into this story. They would buy into the ethical response of the woman. They say, yes, yes, this is right. She did the right thing. She did exactly what she's supposed to do. It is what I would have done if I were a woman. And then comes the punchline. You know, like the first parable, he tells a story. And there's an ethical response she he draws the hearer into the parable, and then there's a punchline. Verse 10, in the same way, and you can imagine Jesus' finger going toward them. In the same way, I tell you, emphatic, uh, shows the emphasis. There is joy in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. In a similar sense, just like that woman, as she called her friend to rejoice over recovering a lost coin, I tell you, Pharisees, I tell you, and he points right at them, there is joy in heaven in the presence of angel of God over one sinner who turns back to God, one sinner who repents. They are just so far from that. Here Jesus is saying, I'm doing this. The fact that I associate with sinner, with riffraff of society, it's because that brings joy to my father's heart, to God's heart. He gets no joy out of you 99 self-righteous people. His joy is in recovery of the repenting sinner. The people that you don't associate with, 
God's joy is when they come to the saving faith. It is a joy of God that fills heaven. It is joy of God that surrounds his angel. He's the one who fills heaven with joy. Of course, we share his joy. Those angels and the people, believers, share his joy. But the joy is his joy. And his joy is out of when a sinner comes back to him. God places the highest value on the worth of a sinner. One soul recovered. Very unlike the frauds and the fakes who serve Satan and who have no love for the lost. You don't find this kind of heart, this kind of attitude in false religions of this world, in false teacher. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you only make more sons of hell with your efforts. So indictment, frankly, is inescapable. How can you affirm the ethical responsibility? You say that shepherd did the right thing to go and find the lost sheep. How you can affirm that? How can you affirm what this woman did? You say, yes, she did the right thing to go and search and search until she find the coin, the, her lost coin. But you are utterly critical and against my ministry of reaching out to the lost soul. How can that be? This is utmost hypocrisy. How can you understand the joy of a village man? And the jo how can you, un you can understand that? You can understand the joy of the village woman, but you cannot understand the joy of God. How can you condemn me for doing that which brings joy to the heart of God? You know, here's that theology becomes clear and the Christology. Let's... Let me take you back through the story in your mind again. It is God in Christ who is that woman. No, I'm, don't take me wrong. I'm not into this feminist theology of making uh, God a woman. Or, no, no, no. But in this story, it is God in Christ who is that woman. God doesn't mind being compared to a woman. It is God in Christ who is that woman seeking the lost sinner hidden in the cracks, in the dust, in the derbies of this dirty world of sin that we are living. It is God in Christ who initiates the search for the sinner. It is God who initiates the search for that sinner because the sinner belongs to him. He loves the sinner. It, it, he doesn't love their sin, but he loves the person. It is God in Christ who initiates the search, and it is God alone who finds, because the coin cannot do anything, the lost sheep cannot do anything, it is God in Christ who searches intently, who comes all the way down into this world, all the way down to death, all the way down to that horrible death on the cross. It is God who sent his son way down, all the way down, to turn on the light of the gospel, to sweep, to search, to pursue the sinner in every dark, hidden place of this world. It is God in Christ who shines the light of the glorious gospel of Christ on that lost sinner. It is God in Christ who reaches down and picks up the sinner, restores him back to the heavenly tre treasury, where his name has been written since before the foundation of the world. And it is God who then, who breaks loose in joy into which all the holy inhabitants of heaven, angels and men, enter into God's joy. The celebration of heaven are not just for the recovered coin or the recovered sheep, but for the recoverer, God himself. For God to recover us, there is costly grace. He had to come all the way down. All the way down to the cross, death on the cross, down into the dirt of the tomb, costly grace, because he was exposed to sin for the first time in his eternal existence. He came down and lived with sinner, down in the dirt, in the derbies, in the cracks of this world. But in that costly grace was great power, because the coin belonged to him. The coin was in darkness. But he had the power to find us, to pick us up and carry us back. There is no religion 
you know, one of the courses I teach at the seminary, World Religion, but I assure you, there is no religion in the world that has a God like this. There is no religion in the world that has God even of their own invention who seeks and saves unworthy sinners because they have value in his view, because they are his own. There is no God in any other religion or school of thought who goes to find his enemies and makes them his friends and children and build them a room in his own house for the sheer joy that he received them in s s salvation, in saving them. He received joy in saving them. There is no God like this one who takes them to live with him forever and finds in them joy and satisfaction. This is our God, rejoicing him. And then uh, this is the character of people of God who truly represent our God, the people who rejoice in the joy of God. The pe when you are part of evangelism, when you are part of missionary activity, directly or indirectly, you are bringing joy to the heart of God the Father. Now, one final comment to make things in balance because, you know, there can be this wrong impression that, okay, all, all I have to do if, you know, I'm a coin, you know, I'm a lifeless uh, object, I can't do nothing and uh, God has to come and find me. I just do nothing. No, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus' theology is complete. One final comment, verse 10. The sinner must repent. Same in verse 7. You know, it says, it says there's joy over one sinner who repents. Yes, the sheep is help helpless, that's right. The sheep is near dead, can do nothing, has to be picked up, uh, put on the shepherd's back, and carried back. The shepherd carries the full burden and the full weight of the search, the fine and the recovery and restoration. The coin is a helpless, dead, lifeless object. Yes, yes. The Lord has to do the finding and restoration, but here you come to human responsibility. Yes, there is God's sovereignty, but also there's human respons responsibility. I have to respond. You know, he says, joy over one sinner who repents. So that means that I have to respond. I have to respond to God's grace. God does, wants all people to be saved. As you can read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. He wants everybody to come to the saving knowledge of his son. But not everybody gives the positive response uh, in, to the grace of God. So there is here is human responsibility. You got to respond. You got to put your faith in Christ. You have to repent, meaning turning from sin, turning from the false gods of this world toward the true God and put your faith in him. You know, the, uh, the picture is complete. The theology is complete. Yes, God seeks, but we have a responsibility to respond. So, dear brothers and sisters, we bring joy to the heart of our Father when we share the gospel. We are connected to his heart when we look at people just how Jesus described. You know, this was offensive to those religious leaders. Comparing God to a shepherd and then comparing God to a woman, uh, Jesus says, you know, you have no understanding of the heart of God. Our God rejoices when a sinner comes to him, and our God doesn't mind at all to be compared to a shepherd or to a woman, but your pride keeps you blind from seeing that. So we are still in the beginning of the new year. May one of our goals for during this year, the last time I talked about three different goals, may it also be one of these. One of our goals be this. We want to share the gospel with people. Share the gospel. Pray for them. Pray for the salvation of the lost. Be a part of a ministry that brings joy to the heart of your Father. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great opportunity 
privilege of being here tonight, worshiping you, praising your name, and learning from your word. As we study through these verses, may we have this kind of attitude that the Lord Jesus described that be humble and uh, put away any kind of pride or prejudice or negative view that we may have towards some people or groups of people, but reach out to everyone with a precious gospel because that is the thing that brings joy to your heart. They belong to you. They are precious in your sight. And may it be that we be part of the ministry that brings joy to your heart. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much for that message, so Rob. Wasn't that a great message? Very good. Isn't it great that Jesus did reach out to us when we were lost to find us and to bring us into the sheepfold? Praise the Lord for that. So let us finish up with one more song here. In your hymnals, if you'll turn to page number 325, it's called Jesus Led Me All the Way. guys for being here again tonight. If you guys need any prayer, please come up front and there'll be somebody here to pray with you. And other than that, hope you guys have a great week and we'll see you next week. All right? God bless you guys.